Okay, so let me start with uh, let's start with some comments that Michael Warner sent me. Oh yeah, those. <laughs> Well, I think it's I think uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, he, you know, uh, I I'm think actually well, imagining that almost as a kind of comedy, um, like you know, it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's almost like like trying to get a goat to go up to a crag and then push it off is a bit like trying to outrun a cheetah on the veldt. Well, yes and no. One of the things I want so <laughs> let me. If you don't mind, let me read what you said so that uh, oh, sure. yeah. I can hear as well. Okay, so this is what you wrote. Anyone who has spent time around goats will know that it's far from easy to put matters mildly to get a goat to go anywhere it does not want to go. Moreover, at the Tsuk, the goat is in its native habitat and may very well be far more sure-footed than the Ishiti. In any event, the outcome here is less sure than that of shrita done in the Azara. If the Ishiti indeed is taking a measure of risk here, I wonder if it is a visible counterpart to the danger the Kohen Gadol faces when he enters the Kodesh HaKodeshim. So a couple of comments about your comments. First of all, I'm pleased that, you know, that you're thinking about this. We, we, we're really trying to imagine what the practicalities of all this were. And, uh, you know, it, we'll go into some a little bit more of that today, but still, we don't know exactly. I will point out one thing is that um, I, I don't have any personal experience with goats, but I also assume that there's a, I'm not sure that taking a, a domesticated goat out into uh, out into the wilderness is its natural habitat. Although goats, you know, you know, we're, we're taken up to, to, um, or still graze. to graze, right? I mean, sometimes in the morning when I'm doing my morning ride and I'm down uh, past Malcha, um, I'll see, uh, I used to see almost every morning this guy who was out grazing his goats. Um, I don't know. I mean, even I, domesticated goats, you watch domesticated goats playing with each other or playing with yeah. their people. Like their favorite game in the world is King of the Hill. Like, okay, I'm in this high spot. I'm going to knock off anybody who tries to get, tries to climb up with me. Um, so, I mean, it is, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, domesticated goat may not actually be taken to graze, graze in the, high, you know, the highlands every season, although that is likely. But even so, it's, you know, Taking a goat up to a crag and pushing it off is, I get, I get a bit dizzy thinking about it. <laughs> this, much, uh, this much I'll grant you, I don't think it was necessarily so simple. In other words, I don't think it would have been that hard for someone to lead a goat for all this way. But I think I think you're right that it's not going to be so simple when he gets to the crag and has to push it off. Uh, so that's it's just an interesting thing to think about. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, you say in, in the outcome here is less sure than that of Shrita done in the Azara. That may be true in the sense that the you know the animal that gets slaughtered in the Azara. Uh, there's a lot more control. And also the Kohen Gadol has other people around him like to hold the animal in place. Oh, here's Paul. Um, and in terms of taking the risk, now of course the risk that the Ishiti has isn't the same qualitatively as the risk of the Kohen Gadol. The risk, right? The Kohen Gadol's risk is that if he does the avodah out of order, he'll be chayav mita, and maybe he'll even be struck down in some divine way. Here it seems that the risk is that if he, you know, it's a little more um, earthly, that if he, if he doesn't... In the worst case scenario, he falls. 
yeah, if he doesn't do this correctly, he can also fall. So there, you know, I think you're right to point out that there would be some measure of risk here. I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything obvious about this, uh, that it would be so easy to take a goat and push it off and push it off a cliff. Um, so I, I thank you for the observations. I, I don't know what else to say about them, but I, I think, um, like I say, I think, it's a, I think it's interesting for us and maybe even important for us to try to uh, visualize and uh, appreciate what happened. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's all worthwhile. So let's go back now to our Mishnah. Let's see. Okay, I think we got up to Mishnah Zion. Right, so in, Mish in Mishnah Vav, we that was this uh, that was the that was the story of what the Ishiti does when he gets to the Tsuk. and then there's a machloket about at what point is he metame yada is he metame begadim. And Tanakama holds from the time he leaves the wall of Jerusalem, Rabbi Shimon holds from the time that he pushes uh, the animal off of the off of the cliff. The Gemara here about that machloka goes into some detail. I think we're going to skip it for for now. I don't think we're going to look at the Gemara now. I think we'll go on. Excuse me. So up to Mishnah Zayin. Balo Eitzel Par V'Sa'ir Hanisrafim. So he comes next to the bull and the goat that are being burned, that are burning, that will, that are burnt. Kraan, he rips them. V'Hotziat Emurehan. And he removes their innards. The tanan b'magais, he puts them into a magais. Magais is some kind of a vessel that will hold the innards of these animals. And he burns them on top of the mizbeah. So, uh, so Balo Eitzel Parvis. So, who is coming to the Parvis Sa'ir Hanisrafim? Can you repeat the question? Who is it that's coming to the bull and the goat that are going to be burned? Oh, Gadol. Uh -huh. So, it's the kind. So, we're talking about the Kohen Gadol. So, we've left the scene that's next to the tzuk, and we're describing what's happening back in the Beit HaMikdash. In the Beit HaMikdash, uh, now the Kohen Gadol is going to come back to the par of Sa'ir HaNisrafim. So what are the, what are the par and the Sa'ir HaNisrafim? What, what are they exactly? What? <laughs> Um, isn't one of them the Tamid, or no? No. We What par and Sayir have we spoken about so far? No, no, no one, one is for the, um, one is for the Kapara of the, um, Koanim in general, and one's for the uh, Kapara of Bnei Yisrael. No, am I, am I completely uh, foggy? No, 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 that, that's correct. So in other words, what happened earlier, 
we had we went through the the uh, procedure for the slaughtering of the par and then in the and the sa'ir and this was the pot the par is a khatat and the sa'ir is a khatat and these are uh, animals that are particular to Yom Kippurim, right? They're part of the tekas of Yom Kippurim. And uh, what we did with them so far is that they were slaughtered, their blood was collected, and then the blood was sprinkled in the Kodesh HaKodeshim and in the Kodesh and on the Mizbech HaPnimi. Uh, but what happened to the actual animals? So let's take a look for a moment back at the Psukim. So, um, so let's read these two Psukim again. So we have... Uh, Beginning in Pasuk Kafalov, the Samacha Ron at Shteya Daval Rosha Sahirachai. So Pasuk Kafalov describes uh, Aaron, the Kohen Gadol, uh, doing smicha on the Sirla Azazel and saying the Bidui on the Sirla Azazel, and that the Sirla Azazel is going to carry all of the sins of. of uh, the people out to Eretz Gzeira. And it says, it's, it's off by saying that in Pasuk Chavret, V'shilach et ha-seir v'amidbar. And he sends the goat to the desert. And then it says, U'ba Aron el Omo'ed v'shanapik de'abad. So then Aron goes into the Omo'ed. He removes his white clothing, asher l'vash b'vo el ha-kodesh, that he had worn when he went into the Kodesh, v'hini cham sham, and he leaves them there. Then, v'rachatzit b'sara b'mayim b'makom kadosh, he washes his flesh with water in a holy place, v'lavashit b'gadav, and puts on his clothes, v'yatsa b'yasa et olato, v'yat olata am. He goes out and he does his ola and the ola of the am, <clears throat> right? So there's an aisle that was brought for them for him and for an aisle for the Am. So he that's a, that's also for a kapara for him and for the people. Then it says in Pasuk So the fat from the chatat is to be burnt on the Mizbeach. So the chatat, we had two chatat. We had the chatat of the par, the chatat of the sa'ir. Um, so it says that the chaleb of the chatat is supposed to be brought onto the mispeach, burnt on the mispeach. And then it says, from the shaleich, it's a sa'ir la azazel. Then the pasuk goes back talking about the person who took out the sa'ir la azazel. That the one who sent out the sa'ir la azazel, yechabes begadav, he washes his clothes, and he has to wash his flesh in water. And then afterwards, he can come back to the camp. So the par and the seir that whose blood had been brought to atone inside the Kodesh, Yotzi el Michutz Lamachane. He takes them, they will be taken. It's a singular Yotzi, but it means both of them together will be taken outside of the camp. The Sarfu Ba'esh et Orotam, the Et Besaram, the Et Pirsham. And then they will, in other words, what's left of them is going to be completely burnt, right? The blood has, uh, you know, most of the blood or a lot of the blood was already taken off. 
then the chalev was taken and burnt on the Mizbeach. And now uh, they're going to be burnt. What's left of them essentially is going to be burnt with their skin and their flesh and the pirsham, uh, the, the parish that's still inside, the, uh, the waste that's still inside. And then the person who burns them, he's also tomei. The person who burns them has to wash his clothes. In other words, his din is like the din of the Meshaleach Asir al Azazel. It's like the Ish Et. That they they both by doing these acts become Tamei to be the Tamei begadim, and so they have to uh, they have to go to the mikvah and they have to topple their clothing to be Tahor again. So this is. This is essentially what we're up to in the Mishnah. Is this what happens to what happens to the rest of the chatat of these chataot that we had? Hang on one second. Let's, let's put this up here. Okay. So I'll just point out that Rashi here on the Pasuk, we have Chelev HaChatat Yaktir HaMizbecha. The Chelev, right? So Chelev Stam means fat, but Rashi explains that Chelev HaChatat means Emu Rei Parvaseir. So even though it's Chelev HaChatat, and it's Chatat is a singular, but the understanding is that it's referring to uh, the 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 emurim, the parts of the body, the inner parts of the body of the animals of the chatot that get burnt on the mispeach. So first they get burnt on the mispeach, and then their carcasses are going to be removed and burnt outside of the Beit HaMikdash, outside of the, in this case, the Mishkan, and in our case, in the Mishnah, outside of the uh, Beit HaMikdash. Rashi says, so they're going to be burnt on the Mizbech, on Mizbech HaChitzon. Right? Obviously, we're talking about the outer Mizbech, the Mizbech HaNechosh, because whereby, whereas the uh, Mizbech that's inside of the Kodesh, it says, Lo ta'alu alav k'toran zarav ola u'mircha. Specifically, we are prohibited to bring on it a, a foreign Torah, or it's only the Torah that the Torah mandates, and we're also not allowed to bring on it an Ola or a Mikha, right? So the Ola in that regard doesn't, doesn't, is not limited to the idea of the Korban Ola per se, but it's uh, any, in other words, you don't bring parts of the of animals to be burnt on the on the internal mizbeach. The only things that get burnt there are the is the ktoret and uh, yeah. Um, okay, so that's just so that we understand when we go back to the Mishnah now. What is the Mishnah talking about? Balo etzel para b'sayir hanistrafin. So this is what it's talking about. It's going back to what the pasuk says that he has to now take the par and the sayir that are going to be burnt, and in order to prepare them to be burnt, kraan v'hotzi et emurehen. So he has to tear them open and remove their innards. 
and those innards, natanan, uh, natanan b'magis, he puts them into a magis, into this kli, v'yiktiran al gabay mizbeach, and he burns them on top of the mizbeach. So we'll see in the Bartzanur that that's lav dafka, the, the, this last thing, the, the haktara al gabay mizbeach, doesn't take place right then, but he, they will be burnt on the mizbeach. Then it says, Kla'an b'miklaot. They are braided in braids. There's also another girsa here that says, Kla'an b'maklot, that they're braided onto staffs, onto, onto, onto rods. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, they're, they're braided into braids. V'hot siyan and uh, he takes them out to the place of burning. And from what, at what point, from when are they from the time they go out of the wall of the Azara, and Rabbi Shimon Omer Mishi Yitzata Ur Buruban. Rabbi Shimon says, from the time that the flame uh, takes hold in most of them. Okay, so Kla'an Miklaot, so he he braids them into braids. So so what are getting what's getting braided or, or tied up? to be taken out to the Beit HaSrefa. Imarim, the insides. Well, actually, no. What's going to happen to the insides? Let's go back. It says, Kran v'hotziyat e'morhean etanan b'magis v'hiktiran agabe ha'mizbecha, agabe ha'mizbeach. So the the Yemurim are put in a magis and they're going to ultimately be burnt on the Mizbeach. So then what what's left for him to tie up and take out? The offal. Intestines, the offal. What else is left? First of all, the offal might what is you you're 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 probably correct about that, but it's but what's what's left? What was there and what was left? The, the... We started off with two whole animals. So we slaughtered them, we took their blood, right? And then now at this point at the beginning of the Mishnah, they're they're torn open and their emurim are, are removed. So what's left to take out? Everything else. <laughs> exactly. In other words, the rest of the animal, the 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 basar, the, the or and uh, and the perish, right? Which would would be included in the offal. But in other words, the, the rest of the animals are going to be taken out and burnt outside, right? The limbs are not burnt on the Mizbeach. The only thing that gets burnt on the Mizbeach are these Emurim. So, so those, in order to take them out, they get bound up in some kind of way. And those are taken out to Beit HaSrefa. They're taken out to this place outside of the Beit HaMikdash where they get burnt. So we understand whose Begadim who's are going to be Tameh. Who's the, who's the fellow who took them out? Yeah, well, and more specifically... The fellow took, takes them out to be burnt. To be burned. In other words, the guy who's going to burn them, right? And we saw that in the pasuk that hasorefo tam yichabes begadav. The person who burns them has to wash his clothes, and he also has to go to the mikvah. So the Mishnah wants to know at what point did he become tamei? So the Tanakhama says 
When they go out, when they, who's the they here? Oh, during during the burning and the rem, and the remnants of the par and the and the if. Yeah, presumably yes. Uh, we'll find out in, in a moment a little bit more about about that. But yes, from the time they leave would presumably refer to them. It ends it, it ends up that it may also refer to people who helped him bring out the animals. But they're not necessary. They're not the ones who are going to become Tame. He'll become Tame by dint of the fact that he's going to burn the animals. And Rabbi Shimon Omer Mishi Tzata Ur Baruba. And Rabbi Shimon says he becomes Tame at the at the time that the fire takes hold of of the robe of most of the animals that, that are being burned. So let's look at the Bartanur Balo. Uh, says, right. So after the Kohen Gadol uh, gave over the Sir Mishtaleach to the one who's taking out the Sir Mishtaleach, then he comes to the bull and to the goats that are that are standing, in other words, Omdim that are like waiting to be burnt. And he tears them and he removes their emurim. Unitanambe Mages, Bikarasha Kle Sharet. So a magais is some kind of a kli that will hold these emurim to be burnt. And the Mishnah says, mm-hmm. he burns them on top of the Mizbeach. So Bartonu explains, you can't explain, you can't say that he's going to burn them now at this juncture. Because at this moment he's still wearing the big day lavan, but dying a lovely krota parasham the big day lavan. He still needs to be reading the Torah with the parsha, wearing the big day lavan. Elahachik and in the the haktara is not apparently going to be done in the big day lavan. Elahachik amar. Rather, this is how you should. Read the Mishnah, Mitanam Bimages Kide Lahak Tiran, Acharkach, Kishiagiyas Manat. He puts them into this vessel in order the, to burn them afterwards when their time comes. The Acharshi Yitbol, the Obash Big Day Zahav. After he toggles and puts on the Big Day Zahav. Uh, and so we'll see that later on in the next ch- chapter. Kla'an uh, b'miklaot, kamin kliya, a kind of a braiding or a kind of tying together. Ushleimim heim im orotam uvisaram ufirsham. They are whole with their skin and their flesh and their perish and the waste. Elashinikra Kresam, except that their bellies have been torn open, Lotsi Emurehan to take out their innards. Bahotsiyan the beta srefa. And uh, he takes them out to the beta srefa, Hutsu Yushalai, outside of Yushalai. Uh, from when do they are they mitame begadim haasukin bahem those who are busying themselves with it kedirti bahasoreif utan yichabes begadav. Rabbi Shimon said, right? So Tanakhama says it's uh, from the time they leave Chomata Azara. Rabbi Shimon says, Mishit Zata Urbiruba. 
just a second. Second rushing. Rashi says a little bit more here than the Rashi of the Kamara. <clears throat> I can find it quickly. Okay, so Rashi on our Mishnah says as follows: Balo etzol par v'chulei, Chazar lo hatana l'sidro harishon. So the Tana now has gone back to its original order. Shum misader avodat kohen gadol. He's arranging. He's giving us the order of the service of the Kohen Gadol, Ktani Balok, and, 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 and he learns in the Mishnah, Balok Kohen Gadol, it's a parvasi, you're held dimly sarei, fachasha masarta mishtaleach, and mishu humalicho, Balok etzla, mukram hotzi ha'emorim. This is basically what the Bartunura says. You can see the Bartunura, as he does often, borrows heavily from Rashi's language. Um, On the on the the miklaot, so Rashi says kimin kliya, right? Which the Gemara says a little bit later, a kind of a braiding. Arba, and he describes it as follows. This is how Rashi imagined it. Arba b'nei adam, there are four people nosin shnei motot who are carrying two staffs. Two in front and two in back. And they're walking side by side with each of the staffs next to each other. The bull the, the, uh, and the goat are placed on these staffs. They are... Uh, Put together one on one on the other. The kofan and they 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 bend one under the other, like a kind of braiding. In other words, they're kind of braided up together. and their whole ella their whole except for the fact that their their stomachs have been open. So that's how Rashi imagines it, that because it doesn't seem reasonable also that just one person is going to take out the carcass of a bull and the carcass of a, um, of a goat, right? So the, that seems to be what the Mishnah is referring to when it says that they're, they're braided into kind of braid. And... Tosus Yamta says on this, Rav Hatikla and the Maklot. He had the Girsa in the in the Bartanura, that the Bartanura said that they were braided onto sticks. Kigirsa Tayushalmi, which is the Girsa of Yerushalmi. Omasha Pireshrav Kimin Kliya. The Rav says that they were put together in a kind of braiding with Sayyim Rashi. Uh, so it's what I just read you. 
right? So he quotes Rashi, who brings this idea that it was two people who were carrying, uh, four people carrying uh, the two animals. And uh, that whole part of Rashi got left, is not in the Bartimura, right? He describes it. And the Tosas Yom Tov theorizes that maybe it got left out because the, the Bartimura uses the word Kliya and Kliya uh, that maybe the person, that at some point when the Bartimura was being co copied, somebody's eyes skipped between the word Kliya, the, the words Kliya. Anyway, that's sort of neither here nor there, but the, uh, that's the idea. So again, at this point in the Seder Hanyam, this is the point. Shev? Yes. What is emurim? I looked at the dictionary. Emurim are one of the seven goyim, ktanim shaman. Emurim, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I was trying to. I was trying to uh, define this more precisely, but emurim is a kind of a shem kolel, in other words, it's a kind of a generic term that means, that refers to parts of the inner body, the, you know, of the inside of the body of an animal that are burnt on the mizbeach. So which, which part? So in this case, it would seem that the emurim that they're talking about, right, is, would be the like the belly and the intestines in that area. That seems to be what the emurim are, are, are here in this context. Not the heart and the... Um, I I'll be honest with you. I don't think so, but I'm not sure, right? Because also the, we saw that the... Um, uh, the Mephoshim said that that the that the Quran uh, seems to refer to the belly. We also saw this language of kriya, which sounds like it was ripped, but probably was open with a knife. We saw that in the description in the in Masechet Tamid, when the Kohen was uh, whoever was getting the korban Allah of the morning you know, ready, they also at some point had to tear it open and remove the parts. And there it goes into some detail about the parts. So I think, I think the parts that were there, I didn't, I, I could check it now, but I think that the parts that are there were, were these parts, they were the, uh, they take out the belly and the and the intestines, and then they have to wash out the intestines and so forth. I think that's what's going on here. Just a second. The, uh, I don't know if the Rambam here adds anything more. Yeah, that, that's all I can say about it right now. But uh, I, I'm pretty sure that's what's being uh, burnt on the staff. That's what's put in the magis or the magis, and it's being burnt on the staff. Um, I'll try to find out more specifically, but the, the word amorine seems to be a kind of a, like I said, it's a kind of a, a, a a collective, uh, an, like a, a collective term, kind of term. I'm not sure that it always refers specifically to specific parts of the animal. So, back to the Mishnah. Uh, 
Okay. So let's finish this off. Amrulo the Kohen Gadol. So they said to the Kohen Gadol, Higia Sa'ir Lamidbar. The goat has come to the wilderness. And from where did they know that the seer reached the wilderness? Darkiot They made darkiot or durkiot or Tosus Yom Tov theorizes that it should really be darbiot. Umenifin sudarin and they wave um, sudarin, they wave scarves. Yodin shehigia seir lamidbar, and they know that the seir has arrived to the wilderness. Amar Rabbi Yehuda, the Haosiman Gadol Hayalah. Rabbi Yehuda says, didn't they have a great uh, sign? Yerushalayim v'adet chidudo shlosha milim. From Yerushalayim to Beit Chidudo, which was a place, that was three meal. Hochin meal, they go one meal. V'chozrin meal, and they come back a meal. V'shohin k'day meal, and they wait the time it takes to walk a meal. Yodin shehigia seir lamidbar, and then they know that the seir has arrived at the wilderness. Yishmael merevahal siman acher hayelah. Didn't they have another siman? Lashon shal zahorit ayak kashur al pitcho shal hechal. A strip of crimson was tied onto the opening of the Hechal. And when the seer got to the wilderness, the strip would turn white. If your sins be as crimson, they will be as made as white as snow. So let's go back. Let's first understand the beginning of the Mishnah here. They told the Kohen Gadol that the seer has arrived at the Midbar. So who's telling him? Who are these people? I assume other Kohenim that are there. Presumably these other Kohenim that are there. They're telling the Kohen Gadol and why does he need to know that? Why is it important for him to know that the seer arrived at the Mipad? Maybe he can't do the next step until the seer has been sent away or reached his destination. Right. Presumably, he has to he has to keep to the uh, to the order that the Torah mandates, and he can't go on until the until this uh, until the seer has gotten gotten to the big bar. We'll see that a little bit more in the parts of Nura. So then, of course, the question is: that's all well and good, but how did they know that the seer got to the mid bar? So do they, mean, do they mean up to the cliff or just that they enter to the, the mid bar? Right. So, so that so first of all, when they say that the Sa'ir got to the Midbar, where exactly do they mean? Do they mean it got all the way up to the cliff and got cliff and got pushed off? Or does it simply mean that it got far enough outside of Jerusalem that now it's in the Midbar? Now, let's try to answer that question from uh uh from the mission itself. So the mission says, how did they know that the seer got to the Midbar? Darkiyot, you will see. They made darkiyot. Darkiyot were these kind of guard posts. And um, we'll see, the Bartunura says that they were big stones that were piled one on top of the other, and there were guards there. And it was, it was set up, you know, reminiscent of the... Uh, of the way they used to uh, set people on mountaintops at night with the 
with the uh, bonfires to signal the Kiddush uh, HaChodesh. <coughs> Here, it's also reminiscent of that. They, they would set up essentially these, these uh, mini, they probably weren't that tall, but they were tall enough, these kind of guard towers, and uh, the signal would be to wave uh, some kind of a cloth and it would start from, <coughs> excuse me. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Right, so they would wave these claws and then they would know that the seer got to the meat bar. So let's look at the bar to know here. <coughs> He's not allowed to begin any other uh, service for the day until the seir arrives at the midbar. Right? So that's, we saw that in the psukim. Uh, and then he can go on and do the rest of the Yavodot. Durkiot. Bartur says, Avenim Gedolot to the Vahod Zuazu. They're large, tall stones, one on top of the other. Shashama Shomrim on Dim and the Nifim the Sudarim. So there the guards stand and they wave their Sudarim. So who, who are these guards? And how? So let's just work this out, it's, I don't think it's that hard, but how would that have worked? According to, according to what we learned earlier, how far does the ECT, how far is he accompanied? Until what point is he accompanied by other people? Uh, he is accompanied until the last meal. Or the last two men uh, Right. So the way we learn in the Mishnah, um, he gets um, he gets up till right the last two meal, and then presumably the, the the person well until the last meal, right? So he comes to the last sukkah. That's at ten. That's at the ten meal mark. The person who's in the sukkah, the person or the rabbam says there could have been many people, whoever's in that sukkah, he can accompany him for another meal. And uh, it says in Mishnah, hey, uh, he stands from afar and watches what he does. So, Bartinu explained, So, from Yerushalayim to the first Sukkah is a meal. As we determine, it's actually five amod less than a meal, presumably. And then there are 10 of these Sukkot, the Benkol Sukkot, the Sukkot, the Harim Yushalayim at Sukkot, Hona, Sarab So from Yushalayim until the last Sukkot is 10 meal. Yushalayim, Sukkot, Hona, Lutzuk, Shnei Milim. Malavino, it's a meal. So they, he's accompanied for a meal past the last Sukkot. Kemidat Chum Shabbat, because for the person who's accompanying him, that's the furthest that he's allowed to go. He can only go. And he stays there? 
That doesn't that uh, seem reasonable. <laughs> Wait, the, because the issue it is allowed to come. The issue it is allowed to come back, and this guy has to stay there. <laughs> he can't move anymore after. He, no, no, he no. For once, one meal. No, no. That's no. Once he goes to two thousand meal, he can't go further, but he can go back. You are He's, allowed to go to go back on, on the, yes, yes, on the yes. Media, yes. Wherever your koneshvita, you get two thousand a moat in any direction, it means that that whole area you're allowed to walk in. So he's allowed to walk all the way back. Yes. Good, good point. So it's it. not the distance, it's the, the trum. The, the, the... Well, that, you know, there was a, the, in other words, the, the way they worked out this whole system of the Sukkot according to the Mishnah, is it's done in such a way that, that the Ishiti can have somebody accompanying him the whole way. And like we said last time, he has a heter to go the whole 12 meal, right? But they don't. So it has to be set up in such a way that they can accompany him and somehow, you know, uh, have, so he's accompanied all the way Except for the last meal. They stand from afar and they see what he's doing. So it, it could be that the, that the person who's there is, the, is going to be the same person who goes up then in one of these dorkiyots and waves a sudar. Or it could be that there were other people. See, the, the Mishnah doesn't tell us how many Durkiyot there were. They may not have needed 10 of them. If the, if, if the uh, terrain is relatively flat and the, and, the, and the way is relatively straight, uh, they may not have needed so many Durkiyot, but they... At, what, at whatever placement they would have had, they would have maybe maybe it's that guy who then goes back and waves a sudar, or or maybe not, or that so that's according that's if we think that what's being reported back to the Kohen Gadol is that the seir was actually pushed off of the cliff. Right, that would seem to that according to that, then then it would have been some kind of uh, procedure, like we just described. That this the according to Bartanur, and according to Bartanur, then the that the person in the 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 person in the last sukkah he could have reported to somebody to wave you know, to wave a sudar, or maybe he himself went and waved a sudar, and then there are other people along the way that are, that are standing watch, and they're waiting to see this sudar. But, but, there, is a, but, but there is a problem. The Kohen Gadol would have to wait all that time, and it's a quite a long time to walk. And you know that on Yom Kippur, you have to do, we have a lot of uh, abodah. And... Uh, Maybe, yeah, I don't know. He has got time to to wait uh, such a, such a long time. Maybe the oh. ishiti was running. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think the ishiti was was uh, was necessarily running. But remember, he also, you know, here the 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 ishiti got sent out. Second. The Ishiti got sent out when the presumably when the Ishiti got sent out, he has something to do. Because then he that's what we learned in the last Mishnah. When at, from the time the Ishiti gets sent out, then he goes and he does he does get the par and the sa'ir hanisrafim ready. So that's going to take some amount of time. And then, then you're right, though. Presumably, that didn't take as long as walking 12 meal, right? So walking 12 meal, if he's 
a robust walker, even though he's fasting, uh, it's, you know, it's still going to take time. <laughs> I don't know exactly how long that would take, but uh, nonetheless, he has to wait until, until he gets word that the, that the seer came to the Midbar before he can go ahead and do the rest of the Avodah. It's at least three, three hours. And maybe the, the goat doesn't, <laughs> doesn't want to go for that. Well, that you know what? <laughs> maybe, maybe this is where we get uh, the minhag in many shuls that we take a break after uh, Musaf before we go back for mincha. To wait, to wait for the miskin. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know what, as a practical matter, I think it's an interesting thing, but, you know, I didn't try to do this, but remember, he's, he's starting basically from the crack of dawn, right? He, in other words, he, he's, he's starting very early in the day. So I think there'll be time for him to do everything, but you're right, you know, it can't go on forever. But that's why they, they set this up. Uh, what I want to do, though, is uh, let's go to the next thing. Amar Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda says, Hello, Siman Gadol Lahem. Didn't they have a great Siman? Because from Yerushalayim, at Beit Chidudo, Shosha Milim. So from Yerushalayim to Beit Chidudo is three meal. Ochin meal, they walk a meal and they come back a meal and then they wait a meal. Yodin sa'ir lamidbar. So what is this Beit Chidudo? And who's walking a meal and coming back a meal? So Beit Chidudo, presumably that's the Midbar. That's that's some point that marks the Midbar, because that's what we're trying to figure out. So Rabbi Huda says, we know that the distance from Yerushalayim, presumably from the time you leave the city, until you get to this place, Beit Chidudo, which is going to be the Midbar, that's three meal. So they walk a meal, they come back a meal, and they wait the time it takes to walk a meal. So who's walking out a meal and who's coming back a meal? Who left, who left Yerushalayim at the time that the Seir left Yerushalayim? The person who walks with him up to the first Sukkah, no? Yeah, so we said that right? the, the Mishnah says that he's accompanied by important, like the VIPs of Yerushalayim. So they walked a meal, which is the furthest they could walk. And then they don't have to stay there all day. They walk back. So they, it took them however long it took them to walk a meal. And then it took them however long it takes them to walk back. And then they wait the time for the, the time it would take them to walk another meal. So then we can assume that after that time, when that time passes, that by then the seir is in the midbar. So if, so if that's the case, so it means to get the seir to the midbar is, that's literally, I mean, it's not until it gets pushed off the tzuk. It's just far enough away from Yerushalayim that it's considered to be the midbar. And then if that's true, then that would also that could also be the same thing for the Tanakama, that the Durkiyot, that they they weren't from the ten from the tenth sukkah or something. They weren't from that far out. Maybe they were only as far as Beit Chidudo. And that would be enough. And Rabbi Ishmael says, Didn't they have another Siman? 
And the other siman was that they had a strip of uh, zuhurit, and that was presumably the strip that was left from the korban chatat, that Rabbi Yishmael says that that strip was tied onto the opening of the heichal, and that when the seir got to the midbar, and again, if, if we're being consistent, it means that the seir got to Beit Chidudo, not from the time that the seir was pushed off the mountain. So from that time, then the, the, the cloth would already turn white. And then this, so this fits in to an idea that we brought up last time, which was that it's possible, it would have been possible for the Ish Iti to what he's tying the Lashon Shel Zahuri to the rock, that it could already turn white. In fact, maybe it already turned white even before he got to the rock. Do you understand what I'm talking about, right? We talked about this last time. That this, uh... Right, what did it say? Mahaya Yosef, Cholek Lashon Chazori, Chetzio Kashar B'Sela, Chetzio Kashar Ben Shtei Kronav, Udechafo V'Achorav, Vuhu Mitgalgel V'Yoreid, Lo Haya Magiyo Chetzi Harad Shnasa Evarim Nebarim. So the Bartanu here said, Chatzil Kashar Besel, Chatzil Kashar Ben Kanav, Lohaya Kashir Koha Lashon Chazorit Besel. He didn't tie the whole uh, strip onto the rock. Shemet Albin Miyad Kodam Tchifat Asa'ya. Lest it turn white before he pushed the goat off. So, What's interesting is, it could, in other words, apparently what we learned from this, from our Mishnah, from the last Mishnah, is that once the Seir arrived at the Midbar, it's, it would have been possible for the, for the crimson strip to turn white. And now remember, there are two crimson strips. There's one for, that was from the Sira Chatat, and one that's on the Seir Azazel. Now, I don't know, but I would think that if one turned white, the other one would turn white at the same time, right? Because but, it's... But Shell, this is a problem because a soul is more than a mess. So <laughs> this is a mess if the, um, if the strip in the Beta Midrash turns white also. And you are... You can't be sure that it will turn right. Maybe the the chataim were so uh, so bad that they they, they won't turn, turn right. Right. It's not okay. Uh, so 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 of course you're you're correct, and of course we know that that like we said before that uh, from after the time of uh, Shimon Tzadik that the strip did not always turn white and that the 40 years before Korban Bayit Sheni, it, it never turned white. So when Rabbi Shmuel is saying this, so either you could say Rabbi Shmuel is talking about, you know, he's being optimistic. He's saying like, this could be a siman. Uh, or he or reflected something that you know that he that he saw. But if it's Stam Rabbi Ishmael, there are different. There was also Rabbi Ishmael Akolin. There were different Rabbi Ishmaels. Stam Rabbi Ishmael was Ben Dorov. He was the right. He was the Chaver of Rabbi Akiva, and he was. He would have been a young, youngish, young, youngish person at the time of Churban Abayit, and. Presumably, he would never have seen that happen if that's if it's Slam Rabbi Ishmael, because it would have been 40 years before it never turned white. So maybe Rabbi Ishmael here is being, you know, um, optimistic, you know, the Grata I'm not sure. 
but it, it's all very interesting. The point, uh, so what we what we see though in, in summary of our Mishnah is that <clears throat> it would have been important for the Kohen Gadol to know at what point the Seir arrived at the Midbar. According to, um, according to the Tanakama, there was a system set up of signals. And that seems to be very straightforward. And the Behuda says that they didn't need the signals, presumably, because they could have just figured it out from the people who walked there and walked back. <laughs> but along the lines of what Paul said about Rabbi Ishmael, you might think that that's also not as reliable because people walk at different paces. Maybe they're not going to make it back. So the Tanakhama's system seems to be the most reliable. And also in, in view of the point that uh, Paul brought up about timing, he, they would save a lot of time, right? If they if the uh, if they use the uh, well, actually that's not true. The they won't save any time, but it would be. I'll, I'll just stick with it's more reliable. It's more reliable if they use the the Durkiot and the and the Sudari. Um, Let's look a little bit more at the Bartunur here. Bad Beit Chidudo. Bartunur says, Hu Rosham Midbar. That's the beginning of the wilderness. Usvir le Rabbi Huda She Nishihigia Haseir Sham Na Seit Mitzvato. Rabbi Huda holds that from the time the Seir reaches that point, its mitzvah is done. Af al Pish Lohigia Latsuk even though it has not yet arrived at the tzuk. Ein halacha ka Rabbi Yehuda. Halacha is not like Rabbi Yehuda. Um, so the way the Bartanura understands Rabbi Yehuda seems to be different than, than the way he would have understood the Tanakhama. And it goes back to our original pshat, that the, the, the system with the sudarin Maybe that refers to Sudarin and the Durkiyot that went all the way out to the Tzuk, or with, let's say within two meal of the, of the Tzuk. And Rabbi Yehud is saying, you didn't have to wait for the Seir to get all the way to the Tzuk. It's enough for it to get to the Midbar. Uh, Right. So it refers to what we said earlier, that he was accompanied. So who are these people who are walking a meal? Those are the Yakire Yushalayim. And then when they go and they come back and then they wait for the length of time it took them to walk there then we would know that the seer got to the Midbar. Um, yeah, and so we're left a little bit with this question. So according to the Tanakama, according to the way we understand the Bartanura now, the Tanakama holds that in order for the Kohen Gadol to continue with the Avodah, he would have to know that the seer was pushed off the Tzuk. According to Rabbi Yehuda, he doesn't have to wait that long. It's enough for him to wait until uh, it, until the seir reached the beginning of the wilderness. And then, according to Rabbi Ishmael, we don't know. Rabbi Ishmael says that you know you can look at the at the Suda, at the at the lashon shel zahorit, and that will tell you. So. Does it tell me that the seer got to the Midbar? Does it tell me that the seer got pushed off the cliff? We now have, we have reason to believe that the Lashon Shal Zuhurit could turn white as early as from the moment that the seer reached the Midbar, according to Rabbi Yehuda, or 
you, as we saw earlier in the, in the Mishnah that talks about uh, the Yishiti and what he does, it's possible that the Lashon Shal Zahorit that he has is going to turn white even when he's just about to push the Seir off. Sometimes that could happen, or maybe sometimes it only happens after he pushes it off. In other words, it's not a fixed thing. This idea of the Lashon Shel Zohri turning white, presumably it's a siman that the sins have been forgiven. So you might think that that's only going to happen once the seer is pushed off the cliff. But maybe not. As we said, in other words, as we see now, there's different, there are different indications. It's possible, as we said also, that once the once the blood is sprinkled from the uh, korbanot chatat, if the siyam mishdaleach drops dead, you don't have to bring another one. In other words, that's the most extreme. It doesn't even right that that you, that it's possible that you don't have to bring another siyam mishdaleach if you've already if you've already done the avodah of the of the seal of chatat. But then I'd say under normal circumstances, it's going to leave you So. How far out does it have to go before it's accomplished its its mitzvah? Uh, we see there are different opinions about that. It's not hundred percent clear. Just just to finish off for today, I was trying to find out more about this Beit Chidudo, and if anybody wants, I, I can send you. I, I after doing a little bit of a search. I found a very interesting uh, article in a in a, uh, a website called Mabat Al, right? The view from above, or a view from above, and I'd never heard of this before. But this is a this is a uh, website that's designed for people who, I guess, fly private aircraft and maps out different uh, important spots in Israel that you can see from an airplane. It's the, it's literally the Mabat Al. So they have a whole article here. Hurikanya uh, Mar Saba. So Hurikanya is a right to place, it's, it's east of uh, Jerusalem. And I uh, have a little video here. So they show you the, this route. And then they, they talk about the different things you're going to see on this route. Um, so there are a lot of, of course, there's always interesting things to see in Israel. Um, so one of the places they get to is Har Muntar. And the, the, you see the headline. So, so funny. Finally, I'm inviting you to come with me to hell. But of course, he he explains Azazel. Right? He explains what Azazel is. He brings the psukim, and then uh, he goes into this discussion about trying to determine exactly where Azazel was. And of course. He's not the first one, and Chokrim have been working on this, I guess, over the years. And um, so here, I'll just read a little bit from this. Chokrim Rabim Misulo Zahot Tatsuk Bim Komonot Shonim Berchadei Hamidbar Mizrachi Sha'er Tzisrael. Right? So different uh, researchers have tried to identify this in you know, one or another place. Uh, in the wilderness that's east of, uh, in the eastern part of Israel, most of them have accepted the identification with Jebel Muntar, Har Hanoter, Hamerchag ben Harabai, the Jebel Muntar, who Kachamesh is a kilometer. This is a distance of about 15 kilometers. Yeah, so, right, so Paul's shaking his hands. Yeah, I mean, we know, let's say, Based on the Mishnah, it's 12 meal. We don't know exactly how far that is. Maybe this is it. The other things he talks about, which uh, 
I mean, is that before or after? I think before he, he maybe the route wasn't that straight. Well, so actually, one of the things he says is it's re like when you're trying to figure this out, it's reasonable to think that um, first of all, it's it's going to be to the east of the city. Where there's other uh, evidence of that, but of course, that's also how he's going to walk out of the Beit Hamikdash. He has to walk out through the eastern gate, heading east, and. It's also reasonable to think that the route that he takes is is a is a would be a known route. It would be a trodden route. It would be there would already be a path there, but not the highway of today. No, right, not not the highway of today. But of course, back back then there were lots of you know lots of these paths that were used for you know for for travel. It's reasonable to think that that would be it. It's also, and also, of course, you have to find a place that that leads. So we have this distance of twelve mil from the edge of Jerusalem. Uh, so we have to figure out a place that is going to be what, however long that is, twenty four thousand amot plus minus. It'll be that distance from Jerusalem. It has to be a relative. I'd say a relatively straight path, um, or at least a well-trodden path that is going to lead to a sheer cliff. <clears throat> so if you're, uh, you know, so, 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 so like the proverbial highway to hell. Yes, exactly. Very good. Um, so one place that people have thought of is this place that's uh, Jebel Munta, and. So he goes on. Um, he says, so it seems not unreasonable. So there's a, there's a little, uh, uh, Wikipedia article about Harmontar. And, uh, this is, this is the map. This is Harmontar. Here's Jerusalem. So, you know, it's it's somewhere around here, the Erech. Um, anyway, he, then he puts in, in bold letters, uh, right? So some people think that this is an incorrect identification and they offer up a different identification, both for the, the way there and to the and for the cliff of Azazel. And this is where he talks about Beit Chidudo. Wait a second. Oh, I must have passed it. Wait a second. Yeah, here we go. Um, so he says, Baruch Makomz at Sarih Yot Bisfar Hamidba. It's clear that this place has to be like on the edge of the wilderness. Karov Yushalayim, close to Yushalayim. Rosh Hamidbar, the beginning of the Midbar, Kafisha Mechanez of Rashi, which is also the language we saw in the Bartanura. Shekain Rak Misham Titkayem Mitzvata Shilua. Right, right. Only from there will he be able to do this mitzvah. According to this, it would be a place that would be a little bit north of what, what has been accepted until now. At Beit Chiduto, Yesh Lazahot in Ha'atar Sha Ein Chod Shebe'al Al Zaria. At Ha'azazel, Yesh Lachapes Bezo Ma'ale Adumim. Right, so according to this, we would find the beginning of the Midbar in al which is a place that you see on this map here. At least I hope you see the map. Yeah. Uh, there's an article about al if you want to look at it. And uh, and then it would end up that Azazel, the, the Clinton, that's the beginning of the Midbar. That's only three meal from Yushalayim. And then the Azazel is going to be somewhere around Maladumim. Of course, if you've been to Maladumim, you could imagine 
finding a cliff in that area to push your goat off of. This works out because this place, which is I, this Enchod of al Azariya, he says it, it's about three mil from Jerusalem, from the old, from what would have been the old city. And the distance from Yushalayim to Ma'ala Adomim is Eser mil, about 15 kilometers. So he likes this better. He, he thinks this is a more accurate uh, identification. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. If you ever take a hike or if you're in a little airplane going over the area, you could look down and say, oh, that must be where they pushed the goat off. So anyway. But you should dig the places to, to find out if there are bones there. Yes, well, that's an interesting point. Did anybody, like, how far did they look? I don't know. And uh, did they find any 2,000 year old uh, goat bones in the Goat area? bones, not, not uh, any yeah. bones. Yeah. Right. And also, would they, yeah, it, it's an inch. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's gone that far. It's an interesting question. Um, yeah, actually, the Gemara also talks about. Um, you know, before the, before, from the time, from the time that uh, the Mishkan was in Shiloh, right, the, the, apparently there also was a place to do it in Shiloh and in Beit Kivon, you know, there, there are other places where the Mishkan was, and they darshan out from Sukim that those places, they, you know, they also had to do it, and they, they also had to push the animal out to the Midbar. Of course, back then, there was a lot more Midbar perhaps, than there is now, just because we have more and more buildings. Like Malved Umim is a place that people actually live, as opposed to 2,000 years ago, when it was probably just a place that people would pass through. Anyway, that's it for today. Um, I think next time we're going to continue on with the, to begin the next chapter. Uh, and that's it. Any last questions or comments? No. Okay, good. Because I need to take it. <laughs> <laughs> good night. Thank you. Good night. Have a nice night. Thanks. 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 Thanks.